Nationalization is a significant risk uh, across much of the globe. And quite often it doesn't occur uh, with uh, the seizing of an asset. Quite often it's creeping expropriation through increasing tax rates over time to the point where it becomes uneconomic to mine the deposits. And so we have to be on alert for that. Today's guest is a supporting sponsor of Liberty and Finance. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We're delighted to have a first time guest today. We're speaking with David Garofalo. He's the president, CEO, and chairman of the board of Gold Royalty Corp. He joins us this first time, Tuesday, July 20th, 2021. David, thanks for coming on the first time. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. We got connected through our mutual friend, Amir Adnani, who I also got connected to through Rick Rule, who our audience is extremely familiar with, having watched him on our channel over many years. And also, Rick Rule, for the first time this year, on his own, not part of Sprott anymore, but as Rule Investment Media, having sponsored the 2021 Natural Resources Symposium, where last weekend I spent Thursday, Friday, Saturday in the Miles Franklin Precious Metals Exhibitor booth, and I understand you presented there on behalf of Gold Royalty Corp. So we'd love to first uh, maybe get just a taste, if we could, from you of what the uh, essential message was that you delivered at the 2021 Natural Resources Symposium, and also what maybe one or two key takeaways that you heard there that really got your wheels turning in a new way or gave you a new perspective. Well, well, I think the key macro theme in terms of what's happening in the economy generally is, um, you know, unremitting quantitative easing for over a decade, really going back to the previous credit crisis um, back in 2009. And that's only been amplified with the COVID crisis that we've experienced over the last year or so. So we've seen massive amounts of stimulative um, money printing, for lack of a better term, uh, low interest rates, in fact, negative interest rates on both a real basis and in some cases on a nominal basis. And that's really uh, setting the groundwork for a sustained rally in gold prices. Um, we've seen gold hold very well at $1,800 an ounce recently. But if you look at the previous cyclical high that we experienced back in 1981 when we last had hyperinflation, and I think we are in a hyperinflationary cycle, gold in 2021 dollars back in 1981 was actually closer to $3,000 an ounce. And I see no reason why we wouldn't achieve that even in the current year, uh, given all of the work that the governments are doing to stimulate the economy with, uh, with significant quantitative easing, for lack of a better term, money printing. So I think that's a, a recurring theme. We've seen valuations in the equity market stretch to unrecognizable levels. Um, there's uh, a recipe there, I think, for a significant uh, correction in, in equity uh, valuations. And that generally is, is a strong indicator of what will happen for gold. Gold is like a canary in the coal mine. It, it's it's a, an accurate barometer of an inflationary cycle. And it's also a place where people protect their capital um, in a volatile equity market. And I think we are headed for some significant volatility in the equity market. So that's, I guess, the theme that I, I was able to, to gather from that conference and, and uh, the message I think it's been consistently delivered by many of the speakers there. As part of your message that you brought to the conference, what was your uh, central point uh, that you made? Well, look, if, if you're looking to protect your capital, I think gold is a great place to be. And if you're looking at gold as an asset class, there are several ways for you to play it. You know, one is you can buy the physical commodity you can line up the bank with your with your uh, ID, with your driver's license, passports and whatnot, buy the physical bar. And a lot of people do that and then store it. And you have to figure a way to store it safely and, and incur the cost of doing that. And I think that there's a lot of merit to doing that. Um, you can buy the ETF as well, which is physically backed. It trades on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, it, it, it's audited every quarter. Uh, you have economies of scale in terms of your storage costs. So that's a way to actually get physical exposure to gold. And in fact, that's opened up a universe of investors that can buy physical gold that couldn't prior to the ETF. The ETF only came into existence about 15 years ago. Prior to that, pension funds, mutual funds, they couldn't buy physical gold. Now they can because there's an exchange traded fund and you know with a quote on the new york stock exchange um but um if you want leverage to both the gold price and expiration you know mining companies provide that expiration upside their reserves are are dynamic 
And if they're a responsible explorers, they're growing their reserves and they're drilling them out and you get leverage to that exploration success. So you can buy gold equities and typically they provide you leverage both exploration and leverage and profitability as the gold price goes up. But I think actually the best way to play the gold market is to buy a royalty company. Um, and, and I'm running Gold Royalty Corp, which we IPO back in March. And what I like about royalty companies is they provide you leverage to the gold price. Um, they provide you leverage to expiration because we own royalties on deposits. They're dynamic geologically. So if they grow geologically through the expiration efforts of the operator, you get that upside through owning a piece of it through you know top line exposure in the royalty. But what I like about royalty companies versus gold equities is we don't have any exposure to the cost structure of the mines. Uh, you know, we're just top line exposure. We take a fixed percentage of the revenue. And if the operating costs and capital costs of that mine go up, uh, well, gold equities tend to underperform in that, in that circumstance. Whereas the gold royalty companies are completely insulated from that cost inflation. And that should be a concern uh, because the industry is significantly underinvested in exploration and development over the last half a dozen years. And as a result, gold reserves globally have gone down 40 percent. That's an existential issue for the gold industry. So what that means is the industry is going to have to invest significant amounts of capital to replace their depleting reserves. That will lead to cost inflation. It has in past cycles. And with the backdrop of inflation in the general economy, hyperinflation, in my view, uh, we see a recipe for significant cost inflation in the mining industry. And given the acceleration in base metal prices, base metal companies are going to be building new mines as well because they have the same sort of existential issue on their reserves. So you're going to have base metal companies, precious metal companies competing for scarce resources to build new mine capacity. We saw this 10 years ago. We've seen this movie before. We saw massive cost inflation 10 years ago when the mining industry went through this cycle of investment and new capacity. We're going to go through that again. And so to get the exposure of the gold price leverage to the expiration without exposure to this inflation risk, I would say buy a royalty company. I wanted to recap a couple of things I heard just to make sure I'm getting it right. And maybe it'll also help it settle into the minds of our, of our viewers as well. So uh, guests have talked to us for years about the fact that in a rising uh, market price environment for the metals, that miners tend to outperform and the argument that's often been presented there is just the the price leverage action the, the idea that if you have already this sort of this base uh, operating cost price and then now uh you're all in costs are say i don't know just say 1400 1300 something like that for gold and now in a, in a 16 1700 gold environment but if you go to a 2000 gold environment you've, you've doubled your your margin on top of that that base cost structure so that's where your leverage comes from that's the argument that keeps getting presented but you just presented a second one which said operating companies that are also doing exploration or expanding the uh asset size of the known uh in ground reserves and, and in ground assets that they have essentially can end up saying now now we own more gold uh, than we did before not just that the price is helping us on the ounces we do produce but now we actually have more because we've done more discovery more ex exploration more development that's a wrinkle that hadn't stuck with me before so did i get that one correctly that's absolutely right and and so you can buy the gold equities for that or you can buy the royalty companies and, and to do that as well um i wanted to get now so the royalty thing then you added another uh uh little thing onto there that really stuck and that for, with me and that was that in addition to and we've had multiple guests talk about royalty companies I want to ask a few more questions about that because Rick Rule has often told us you got to maintain dollar liquidity and bullion liquidity and then if you're going to start investing because you have a good base of dollar liquidity and bullion liquidity which gives you the ability to act as a contrarian and take advantage of opportunities that present themselves when you do start investing into he said royalty companies are a great way to start uh, that investing exposure because right away with a single company um, ownership you may have a right away a diversity you know whether it's in multi minerals or whether it's geographic diversity a diversification that sort of thing and you already have a team of people doing due diligence for you who are experts in the industry they're doing that that credit analysis uh, and the all productivity, they're doing the team management team, track record assessment and all that sort of thing that you don't have time to do if you're not a professional like he is. Okay, but then you said something else and that is 
in an inflationary environment with this backdrop of potentially hyperinflation, depending who agrees what the definition of that is, in this inflationary environment, that the cost downside of being an operating mining company is not shared. That risk is not participated in by the royalty companies. They get to just go off the top line, not the bottom line. So in an inflationary environment, royalty companies are especially the beneficiaries of that. Interesting. Huh. Did I hear that one correctly too? You, you, you're bang on. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. So let's get back to that topic of why royalty companies just for a minute. We've heard some from a couple of guests already about why royalty co companies are different from owning direct direct ownership of shares in, in the mining or exploration companies. Can you talk to us about, I guess, gold royalty uh, and royalty companies in general on how is it that if you could I, I enumerate the real benefits to an investor, especially a new investor mm -hmm. of owning a royalty company rather than directly buying a mining company? You mentioned cost, not participating in costs. Okay. Yeah. So, so again, um, what we have is a royalty, a fixed percentage of the revenue on, in the case of Gold Royalty Corp, we have 18 royalties on 18 different development stage projects. And so we participate just on the revenue line. And so we don't uh, invest anything in the capital costs. We don't get exposure to the operating costs. And again, an inflationary environment, which I think we are going to be experiencing increasingly in the mining business, um, you're better off being exposed to the top line. And so in an inflationary environment, gold price does extremely well. So you get the leverage to the gold price upside. Um, you get leverage to the exploration success of the underlying operators. And, and the industry has to reinvest back in exploration given the downward dynamic we've seen in reserves. So there is going to be some exploration success uh, from all the capital that's actually getting deployed in the ground right now. And you'll get exposure uh, to that through the royalty companies. And we, with 18 royalties, we have asset diversification. We're America's focus, but we have asset diversification. And not only that, in the case of Gold Royalty Corp, we announced a merger with a like-sized company, Ely Gold, um, just a couple of months ago. And we're going to be completing that transaction this quarter. And that will actually increase our royalty portfolio more than fivefold. We'll go from 18 royalties to over 100 royalties across the Americas, four of which will be producing, eight which are in development, so we're going to have a cash flow profile that's going to increase at least fivefold over the next five years, uh, just through uh, cultivating the pipeline that we already own on a pro forma basis with the merger with Ely. Remarkable. I mean, five times is a big expansion in the number of assets that are going to be uh, you'll be drawing benefit from. Can you talk to us a little bit about the any diversification or noteworthy? Uh, or best in class or whatever of the existing assets that you already have, the first 18 that you already have? Yeah, we're, we're a precious metal focused royalty company. I think that's important because uh, I think when investors buy royalty companies, they want purity of exposure um, because gold royalty companies tend to trade at a superior multiple uh, to, uh, to other royalty companies that have more diversified uh, metals exposure. And that's important because that drives down our cost of capital and makes us competitive for more gold royalty opportunities that we're looking at. That being said, some of our deposits have significant byproduct credits. We have copper byproduct credits in a number of our projects. We have exposure to over 2 billion pounds of copper resource um, as a byproduct to some of our uh, existing um, development stage assets. That's a lot of copper exposure and uh, what I would argue is a is a bull market for copper, particularly as we look to decarbonize our economies. That's, that's a very copper intensive. Um, it, we have to drive up demand for copper in a significant way to decarbonize, to grow electric grids, to uh, produce more electric vehicles. Electric vehicles typically have three to four times the amount of copper per vehicle than an internal combustion engine does. So to really decarbonize our, our economy meaningfully, we need a lot of copper. So having that a copper exposure is a nice little icing, if you will, on the cake uh, for our shareholders at Gold World Corp. The other thing we wanted to ask you about was what the road you see ahead. We, you mentioned briefly there the electric economy and the demand for these other these other metals. In, in addition to monetary metals, base metals like copper and others, are these um, new uh, assets that you're expecting to bring on line with this merger that's that's planned uh, going to increase uh, focus on the monetary metals, specifically gold, or do you see more multi-mineral um, diversification as, as part of that merger as well? 
Well, our, our focus is very much on precious metals, but as I said, from time to time, you have deposits that are polymetallic in nature, so they have other uh, byproduct credits to them or byproduct metals to them, copper. In some cases, we have silver, but again, I see silver as a as a um, cheaper proxy for gold. People tend tend to buy silver as a as a more leveraged uh, way to play the gold price, but typically silver. Uh, it rallies much more strongly in a bull environment for precious metals than gold does. Um, and the gold to silver ratio right now is quite wide and it should narrow, which, which, which should drive the silver price up significantly more than the gold price does in a, in, in a rising gold price environment. So that's another way to play the precious metal space. So we have plenty of exposure to both, but we're very much going to stay focused on precious metals because again, in a competitive environment, we're competing against other royalty and streaming companies for uh, royalties that come into the market. We want to make sure we have a competitive cost of capital. And pure gold royalty companies tend to get a better multiple in the market and as a result are able to access capital more cheaply and become more competitive as we allocate capital to new royalty opportunities. And we do so expecting to get double digit rates of return. Um, you, you know, on a net basis, net of our cost of capital. So it's very, very important that we maintain a low cost of capital to maintain that competitiveness. I mentioned earlier that we both were attending the 2021 Natural Resource Symposium last week. It's noteworthy among conferences that the attendees, specifically the presenters at that conference in particular, are hand chosen by Rick Rule based on their merits, not just because they signed up. And in that, one of the things that he's emphasized to us when he's appeared here over the years is about the importance not only of the assets in the ground, not only of the strength of the balance sheet, but also the track record of the management teams. I know he has a long-term relationship with Amir Adnani, who we have interviewed on our channel, uh, but can you talk to us about why uh, Rick Rule would have focused on Gold Royalty Corp, specifically the serially successful management team? No, it's an excellent question, and I've known Rick for decades. Uh, literally, I've been in the mining business myself for over 30 years, but in an operating role. And and that's a distinguishing feature of Gold Royalty Corp relative to our, our junior royalty peers in the space. And many uh, of those are being run by financial engineers, former sell side analysts, uh, former investment bankers. In fact, my board management collectively has over 300 years of mine operating experience. And so I come from an operational background. I ran Gold Corp, uh, which we merged with Newmont in 2019 to create the world's biggest gold mining company by market cap and production. Before that, I was running a base metal company called Hud Bay Minerals. And before that, I was the CFO at Nico Eagle Mines, uh, limited for 12 years. And before that, another base metal company for eight years. Over my 30-year career, I've been involved in the development of 15 mines across the world actual construction of those mines and countless more I've been responsible for operating. So I come from an operational background. If you look across my board management, that's certainly the case. Uh, they come from an operating background. Why that's so important is one, because it gives us a clear eyed view of the underlying risk of the uh, companies or the assets we're investing in and taking royalties back in. Um, so we are well equipped to do due diligence because we know how operators think, we know how mine developers think and we understand the risks associated with what they're doing. Um, and so we're able to better cost out uh, the opportunities and, and the risks associated with that. The other thing it gives us is access. Um, you know, I ran one of the biggest gold companies in the world um, and created one of the biggest gold companies in the world in the merger with Newmont. And um, as a result, um, my team and I have access to, to virtually any company in the world. That affords us uh, bilateral opportunities on royalties because quite often royalties are sold in auction processes and they get bid up significantly because it's a bit of a stamping, it's a bit of a cattle call. We tend to buy our royalties through bilateral opportunities where we have access to somebody and we become aware of an opportunity before it's available to the general marketplace. And so we're able to get them much more cost effectively with what much better return propositions for our shareholders. Something you just touched on a little bit ago is about risk reduction. And I we have a question from our viewer specifically about that. In fact, our channel, which is now Liberty and Finance, uh, people are concerned, for example, over the last year and a half, how many of our liberties have been curtailed in different geographical jurisdictions. And they're also concerned about that type of constraints on business, such as mining, exploration, etc. So here's a question from Leighton Wilson. He says, 
My question is, when the, quote, Great Reset has been fully realized, do you think that desperate governments around the world may seize and nationalize the precious metals producing assets on their soil and thus exclude already existing investors in those companies from being able to profit from their positions? Or are there any safeguards against such a scenario? So as you evaluate, as your team evaluates the best prospects from an asset standpoint and a profit and loss, you know, uh, balance sheet standpoint and a management team standpoint and all that, what do you, what, how do you assess geographical jurisdictional risk and h- how does this potential scenario about the threat of potential nationalization of assets play into your risk assessment? Well, the new gold royalty corp post the merger with Ely, um, with over 100 royalties, is entirely in the Americas. Uh, so we already have uh, intrinsically uh, a much lower political risk profile than some of our competitors who are spread in, in more risky geographies. And as we look at new royalty opportunities going forward on a combined basis, our focus will be on jurisdictions that have uh, an, an established and rational regulatory regime for getting new mines permitted and expanded and also um, proven government support and receptivity to natural resource investment. But also importantly, with operators, operating partners, because we're not the operators, we're gonna own royalties on on assets that are operated by other companies, but operators that have a proven track record of success in those jurisdictions. Those are the key criteria of anything we're looking at. Nationalization is a significant risk uh, across much of the globe. And quite often, it doesn't occur uh, with uh, the seizing of an asset. Quite often, it's creeping expropriation through increasing tax rates over time to the point where it becomes uneconomic to mine the deposits. And so we have to be on alert for that. We have to be in jurisdictions, as I said, that have rational regulatory regimes, um, over many, many decades, it's demonstrated receptivity to foreign direct investment, um, and particularly in the natural resource sector. And so we're going to be quite stringent about what jurisdictions we enter into. Another criteria that we haven't discussed, we talked about several, but we haven't talked about ES and G, environmental, social, and so on. Um, there's a question here from PV who says, what does the future of carbon credits mean for mining corporations? We've talked with people about the petroleum industry, about the energy cliff and metals shortage and all sorts of things. But can you zero in on this interesting interplay between sort of pro-environment policies that are coming out and how that may affect the mining industry? Yeah, look, I I think that the mining industry is actually in a fairly good position. I don't see us as a terribly carbon intensive business. Um, uh, we have the potential of actually accumulating credits that we can trade to more heavy industries. And in fact, we're becoming less carbon intensive over time because we're seeing more and more mines move towards electrification of their their fleets. Um, In fact, when I was running Gold Corp, we built the first all electric underground mine in the world in Northern Ontario uh, called the Borden Lake Mine. It's still operating. It's a relatively low tonnage mine uh, at about 2,000 tons of ore moved per day. But what it tells you is that that type of technology, electric vehicles uh, are being um, scaled at a rapid rate. And I think inevitably, you're going to see them a much large scale, much more large scale open pit mines. You're going to see much more electrification. We're actually seeing um, alternative energy sources being introduced at mature mine sites as well, whether it's uh, solar or wind um, in, in some of the more remote regions. And that's driving down carbon intensity dramatically as well. So I think the industry is doing a very, very good job of of driving down carbon intensity. Where I see the most significant uh, roadblock to mine development is water intensity. We still need to do a much better job in that as an industry. Uh, We still consume a lot of fresh water. And I have to tell you, wars are fought over water. And, And if we as an industry don't drive down our water intensity, it's going to be the biggest impediment uh, to, to new mine development. And that means uh, doing non-traditional tailings disposal because tailings uh, disposal, which is our waste, is very, very water intensive. Um, this is the waste that comes out of our plants and, and needs to be submerged in water so that the deleterious elements in, in that waste are, are dispersed and diluted. We need to go to uh, new, newer technologies like uh, dry stack tailings, which effectively is dehydration of your tailings and creating an inert material that you can just stack like bales of hay. And the added benefit of that is you never have the risk of a tailings, uh, tailings disaster. 
because that material doesn't move. Traditional tailings impoundments, which have a lot of water, they have tailings dams and valleys. Sometimes those dams breach and they can lead to catastrophic results for downstream communities, uh, for uh, waterways. And so as an industry, we need to get out of that. Um, and so I'd say that's a bigger risk than, than um, on, on carbon intensity. I think we're doing a good job. Now we need to refocus on water intensity um, as operating companies. Something I think people can relate to right away when you mentioned about the scale up of electric vehicles, it's certainly the case over the past, say, decade or so that people were familiar, like with specifically the Toyota Prius was like the, the poster child of the electric car that came out. And it's a small car and, you know, economy sized car, that sort of thing. And people thought, well, OK, electric vehicles is OK, but only when you use them as a little basically it's a scaled up slot car. It's a it's a it's a, a toy car. But um now we're seeing, you know, not just with the Tesla uh, cyber truck or whatever, but most of the major truck manufacturers that people could go purchase in the next few years are going to be electric uh, vehicles as well. So that people can relate, even in, even at the consumer level, people can relate to seeing that the, the scale up of electric vehicles from the smallest to the most powerful. I guess it takes me back to my model railroading years when we went to go see real uh, diesel electric hybrid uh trains go by that that that's been used in heavy uh industry for some time is is electrically propelled uh, vehicles that's that's right yeah david one thing i almost forgot to ask you we like to put our guests on the hot seat and ask them a technical concept or term that they could define to educate me and to educate all of our audiences and if you could think of this whole royalty model that we've been talking about that gold royalty corp uh, exemplifies is there one term or one concept that you think it would be really helpful for people to understand if you could define it for us? Yeah, look, I, I think it's an arbitrage business at the end of the day. And I think everybody understands what arbitrage is, but as it applies to the royalty business, um, as I mentioned earlier on, royalty companies typically trade at higher multiples than the operating companies do because the underlying risk profile is much lower. You know, we don't have exposure to operating capital costs, as I said. And so as a result, we can raise capital much more cheaply than the operators can. So effectively, we act as a bank uh, for the operating companies and development stage companies in the gold business that are having other, having um, difficulty otherwise accessing capital. So we access it at a cheaper rate, and then we deploy it into the development companies and operating companies to help them build up new mine capacity or expand their existing mines. And then we take a royalty back in return. That's how we generate a return. When we do so, expecting to get double digit rates of return on that allocated capital. So it effectively is an arbitrage business. We're the banks, we're very much mining focused banks for the operators and developers. That helps plug a little piece into a puzzle for me because as many uh, royalty companies as we've introduced to our viewers, the question tends to come up is like, well, if this is such a sweet um, deal that the royalty companies get where they get to participate in the revenue and they don't have to deal with the cost, then why would the mining companies put up with that? Why would they take the heavy, the heavy burden part of the job and let you guys take the cream off the top? This helps to explain that is because you can provide access to capital at a lower rate than they can access it without your help. Yeah, and I, and I can provide you a tangible example. Um, when I was running Hud Bay Minerals, a base metal company, okay, and we were building a new copper mine in Peru called Constancia, and it was a $2 billion U.S. investment to build that mine out. Uh, it was very difficult for us, us to access equity capital because we were trading at 0.5 times the underlying value of our business, which base metal companies typically do. They trade at a discount to the net asset value of their business. I called up Wheat and Precious Metals, uh, the streaming royalty company, second biggest by market cap in the world, and said, um, can you provide me a, uh, a, some capital against my precious metal component, my, my deposit? 5% of my revenue is gold and silver. Um, it's not going to affect the underlying economics if I sell that off or pre-sell it. And we Precious Metals cut me a check for $750 million uh, for that stream, which went a long way towards um, building out the capital base we needed for that new mine development. And the reason they were able to do that, while we were trading at 0.5 times NEV, we and Precious Metals was trading at two times NEV. He paid me one times NEV for that stream. So I got an arbitrage gain from 0.5 to one times. He got a gain because he got that stream for one times and got re-rated in the marketplace at two times. Everybody won. That's the arbitrage. And so that went a long way to further 
my success in my career because that was the biggest mine I'd ever built. And if I didn't have access to that streaming royalty pot of capital, there's no way that mine would have been built. And today, that mine is the cornerstone asset of HUD Bay. It has 30 years of mine life ahead of it. It's it's a steady state producer, generates significant amounts of cash flow, particularly in this high copper price environment. Well, thank you very much. I think that really helps to put some flesh onto an example. Real world examples are always the best. So now, uh, if people want to find out more about Gold Royalty Corp, where's the best place for them to start? Well, we're at goldroyalty.com, so it's easy to remember. Our talk trading symbol on NYC American is uh, G R O Y, G Roy. And uh, we will make sure we put the links to any information like that in the description of this video. Will we also be able to, is the uh, planned merger that you mentioned with Ely uh, to, it's going to expand your set of assets, has that already been released as a press release that we can put a link to in our description as well? It is. It's, it's on both ours and Ely's website. And uh, uh, there will be a shareholder circular mailed out in the next few days, in fact. And there's going to be, um, Ely will have a shareholder meeting in August to approve the merger. We've been speaking with David Garofalo. He's the president, CEO, and chairman of Gold Royalty Corp. This very first time on Liberty and Finance. David, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on.